All right. So on today's podcast, we're going to talk about when is it smart to go into the trenches and when is it a waste of your time? So before I hit record, I was telling Michael, I see a lot of people, they always talk about, oh, I don't really have much involvement. Oh, I don't do this. I don't do that. And they're, they're not willing to get their hands dirty to, you know, go above and beyond for sellers or buyers or tenants, whatever, probably not tenants, but, you know, uh, for people that you do business with. So you can obviously stay consistent and have consistent income coming in because a lot of people I've found, Michael, when when a deal gets messy and it's all of a sudden requiring more work than you thought, they kind of put their hands in the air and they start complaining and whining. And if you want to be dealing with off market sellers who have problems that we solve for a profit, this is going to happen more uh, than it's not. Right. So, Michael, what, what is your experience with this? Because, I mean, you were sure, buying so. auctions for a while and that really wasn't. Probably right. So, so for the first four years, all I did was buy at auction. So I didn't even know what marketing was. I didn't understand the concept of going direct to seller. I thought wholesalers were morons. And uh, the only way to really extract, to create value was to buy something at the auction. And I was a fool. But what I've learned over the last six or seven years is that, as you said, we get paid to solve problems. And in yes. many cases, the more complicated the problem, the more money we can make. And we 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 did a we did a podcast before about a guy who really had his whole business sort of running on autopilot and who yeah. shockingly had his cost to acquire go up from four hundred dollars a deal to four thousand dollars a deal and he was making mess, less and less money. And what 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 we well, what I said about that was that that's very common, right? Even if you're on top of it, but certainly if you're not on top of it. If you're not on top of your business, this could be like 27 different reasons why your business gets less profitable. But the idea, and we did another podcast about this myth of passive income. That was, everybody thinks that they're going to wholesale a few deals, then they're going to flip, and then they just buy rentals, and then just sit on a beach and not do anything. But we, we, I think we both agree that they, that's a myth, right? You're not going to sit on a beach not doing anything. You're always going to be involved in your business, right? That book that you just reviewed, The Road, the road Less Stupid, I, one of my favorite books. Great book. And he writes, it just doesn't happen, right? And that, 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 that Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos are, are not shipping out their software or their, or their stuff from Amazon, but they're always involved in the business, right? We look at it as, well, I'm going to take this 30,000 foot look at my business and just like push a few pawns around on this chessboard when they, when they seem to be out of place. But the truth is we always have to get involved, right? And we always have to, right? And we all, you, I, we all dream of, of creating this business and hiring people that are going to run it that will have minimal involvement, but there's always going to be involvement. So this idea that you can't really get your hands dirty on a deal, I think is absurd. The, the, the goal, I think, should be to create great processes and have great people that know how to run the processes. But there's always something that, is screwed up, right? So uh, Gary Harper, Susan Harper, which really people that are great that help a lot of guys that we know run their business, they say that your processes should handle like 80% of what can happen. But guess what? There's, there's 20% is going to come up a lot. And you or I, whoever's running the business are going to have to get our hands dirty and deal with doing something nuts uh, here or there and doing something that is out of out of the ordinary, out of the norm. And that we have to get get involved with. So the idea that this, that's never going to happen is absurd. Yeah. It always happens. It just has to be worth it for our time, right? We can't we can't be saying that we're going to get involved to do things that, are, as we say, are ten dollar an hour jobs. That's foolish. But if there's a big deal that's hit, that's hinging upon somebody getting really in the weeds to 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 do it or in the trenches to do it, then of course every we're all, we're all going to jump into into that something like that for sure. Totally. No, so that's the thing I see with people. And here, here's like a little step-by-step -step kind of takeaway for people. If you're tasked with doing something you don't normally do, like let's say it's not a reoccurring task, like calling someone back or whatever. Like I'll just give you an example. So Brett on my team locked up a house last last week, I think he got under contract and we got it sold to a buyer relatively quickly in terms of like got a full price offer, a wholesale deal. And, you know, it's in New York. We had an option contract on it. So now we got to scramble and get a purchase and sale on it. And what ended up happening was the seller, she actually lives in Queens and she was like, you know, kind of like balking at the fact of using Dropbox. So then Brett, so Brett's highest and best use of time is negotiating to get a yes, right? That's the truth. Once he gets a yes, him on the phone with a seller is a waste of his time because it's it's just like, what what's the point of that, right? We make sure they're on board. And then at that point, it actually falls onto my lap. 
So the sell, this was literally an hour ago. Seller is like, I don't know how to use Dropbox. And I literally got on a Zoom call with her. She doesn't even like me because she thinks I'm kind of a savage because I'm like not that nice. And she's like, you're very nice. You're much nicer than I thought. And I'm like, well, thank you. Let's keep moving forward here. Get on a Zoom with her, walking her through. I'm sharing my damn phone screen. This is how you download Dropbox. Okay, you're going to click this. You're going to click that. You're going to open this. And then we get all the way to the finish line. I taught her how to scan a document, which was the contract she had. And she's like, I don't want to do this. And I'm like, why? And she's like, because <laughs> I don't feel comfortable taking a picture of a contract. And I'm like, okay, well, what, what's your, what's your alternative? She's like, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow and I'm going to manually scan this and I'm going to email it to you. I said, okay. So if you don't do this tonight, you're going to go to the office tomorrow. You're going to get up out of your house and you're going to drive to your office to then do something that you could have done on your phone. And then you'll email it to me tomorrow and I'll have the contract. She's like, I promise I will. Listen, could I have pushed her and been like, come on, no. But the way I look at that is like me investing the 10 minutes on a Zoom call with her is going to make our company about $18,000 if I have my druthers. Mm -hmm. I look at that as a pretty good use of time because I want to get that contract signed so I can get the contract to the buyer so we can make a deal happen. I right? think it's a I think it's the best use of her time. There, there are times, right? And then yeah. I think we'll, we sort of have to look back on our day and our week and say, do we use our time effectively? Yeah. But you know exactly what the best of use of your time is because you're... Yeah. You are great on the phone, especially with solving problems. And you know, the bread is great on the phone, getting the, yes. getting the seller to a yes. So yeah, you have yeah. to, everybody has to analyze what they're really good at and what they, what they're good at and what they want to do, right? There are things that I'm good at that I do not want to do, right? I have a disposition okay. manager. I could probably negotiate slightly better with some of our, our buyers, right? I'm good at juggling and bullshitting with them, but I hate doing that. So I'm happy to pay someone else to do it. So you have to analyze really what you're good at and what you want to do, what you want to do. Right. And then when those things come together, that's clearly the best, best use of your time. Couldn't agree with you more. Here's another actionable takeaway for people. So I, I still do this every day. Uh, I call it the pipeline management report, right? Pipeline report. It's like the weather report. This is the pipeline report. So I look at all of the properties I have. I do this on a spreadsheet. I don't have it. Like you have like the board in your office. I just have a spreadsheet. And at every deal that I own or that I, either I own it, I'm in contract to buy, I have an accepted offer, whatever, you know, it's in construction, whatever the case might be. I look at every single, this is a daily reoccurring thing to me. Every day I have to check off pipeline and I see every property. And then I make sure I, when I review every property, if there's any actions that me or my team has to do to move that deal forward, right? And what that does is it allows these properties to not slip through the cracks because a lot of times, and this is the New York show, you get it like we had an accepted offer last week and then the guy changed his mind and then he wanted more money all of a sudden. So now Brett had, we had to take him from the deal board. Brett had to go back to the negotiation, work out some sort of a inspection contingency, which somehow we're going to get away with and which is not normal and then put it back onto the deal board and then reassign a different task, which is now we're going to wholesale it because we were going to flip it. And now with the numbers, we're not. So there's always going to be like things that are going to be like kind of you're juggling with. It's going to go out of the accepted offer board into the contract board, into the contract board, into the pipe, like the wholesale board. Like you have to understand how to manage that because even if you're new, like if you don't have any, like Michael and I have dozens of properties, but when you're new, you want to do that with your leads because you're probably not getting a lot of leads. Therefore you need to manage your leads really hard. And then, did this lead, did I do everything I could on this lead? When should I call them back next? What should I say when I call them back? Like, you know, you, you, you never want to get too big for your britches. Could I sit back on my ass all day and go in Slack and just like make sure everyone's calling people? Sure. But I actually will go in and observe and, and make sure everyone's got action items and, you know, hold people accountable to calling people back. Maybe the tech's not working, but I'm heavily involved, right? And, and, and I know that if I spend my time making sure all the pieces are slowly moving together. And then I can also focus on like today I had a call with a PPC vendor. I'm actually switching vendors and I had a call with the vendor and we spoke about my campaign and why it's not working that well and how it could be better. And then I made a decision on the spot. I said, okay, I'm going to cancel my current one. I'm going to go on board with you. What do you need from me in order to move forward? And there's always a clear next step. Right. And honestly, that was probably the best thing I did all day was besides get on the phone with that seller. It was like, Hey, I'm going to take this ROI marketing channel. I'm going to move it over with these adjustments. And hopefully that will produce us a better ROI, which will lead to more revenue. You know what I mean? So it's, it's always like looking at the thing you're doing and Absolutely. making sure it somewhat leads to revenue or else you're just wasting time. And I think that people 
and we discussed this before in the podcast, I think that people don't understand that, like, the reason why we make money is because a lot of deals are hairy, right? Oh. And they have problems. And oh. people, you know, people who get, are new in this business, they get all crazy when a title issue comes up or a seller changes their mind or a buyer flakes out. That's part of the business, right? If that didn't, if that never happened, we wouldn't be needed, right? There would be some uh, amazing marketplace where all these people can get together and solve all the problems together. The reason why we exist is to fix those those messy deals, and then we hope we get some clean deals here and there. But usually, there's some that we have to get involved in, and that is why we get paid. I, you know, people don't understand; they think they're going to get into this business, and it's just going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to. I'm going to call 100 people and 95 of them are going to answer and 85 of them are going to sell a house and 50 of them are going to are going to get give me my price and then I'm going to put it out in some imaginary buyers list and and everybody's going to pay me $40,000 more than my number. It just that's just not reality. This takes work, right? It's called work for a reason and we get paid very well because we do a lot of work and obviously when you're in it for longer you, you have the experience to solve even more complicated things. But even when you get in at the beginning, don't think it's just this easy, schmeezy, breezy deal where it's just going to go. You know, I hope I hope every deal works like that, but more likely it's not. Yeah, especially when you start dealing with like inherited properties. Like I've found that those are the most complicated, but usually they're the most lucrative, right? Because the sellers don't know how to solve it. So you're the one solving right. the problem. Like we had a property and I can't, I can count on seven hands, but like the property owner doesn't know what to do because they've <laughs> never done it before, which makes sense. The house is in disrepair. They might live out of state. They're like sitting here like, what do I do? They don't even know the first step. And a lot of the times when we get these really good deals, we don't have to compete with a lot of people because like we, I'll give you that, that new Paul's house, the one that we're doing right now. She tried to sell this to like two or three different wholesalers and every single wholesaler just like smoked her. Like a lot of times her, well, some of the times I know her price was too much. She finally came down to reality with us, but she told me on the zoom call, she's like, I like you guys better because you guys actually like are listening to me and you're not just like BSing us. And look, listen, I don't, I wouldn't say I'm the nicest guy. I'm not like, this is not a Greg is the best. I'm not, I'm kind of a dick. I'll be honest. I would, I would say that, but you would. <laughs> listen, but the thing is I am, that's why I have Brett. Cause I'm not, I can be good on the phone and patient, but my normal kind of demeanor is like, let's, what's the goal? Why are we on the phone? What do we cut? Like you can't do that with people. Right. Cause it's just, it's, it's more than that. But the point I'm trying to say is, when you can take the time to really understand somebody and listen to them, they're going to most likely, assuming your number isn't like from outer space, sell to you for a little bit less because they'd rather work with someone that they know, like, and trust. And that can be over the phone too. It doesn't need to be in person. And there's real dollar value in that. People think like, oh, they're getting three offers. There's no way they're going to take my offer. Like if you're like a good person and you actually can listen to them, the odds of the other two people being the same way are slim. So if you just make sure you get in their corner, I have really found that, you know, when they get a few offers, it, unless they're straight up commodity shopping to begin with, which we'll uncover right away, like you can win a lot of those deals. I mean, I'm sure you see this a lot in Long Island. There's a lot of people in Long Island, you know, doing this. I mean, this sure. is not a secret. How do you uh, win deals when there's other buyers, when it's a winnable deal, when it's not a price shop? Yeah, it's really forming, as you said, it's forming some kind of bond between between you and the seller, which doesn't always happen. Sometimes it doesn't happen, and, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. And sometimes it's just a it's just a, a situation where they're going to go with the highest. But I, 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 a lot of my deals, probably more than half, I'm the only person making. That's them crazy, off. dude. I, I, I think Long Island is less competitive than the Hudson Valley. I feel like every day there's a new yuppie in the Hudson Valley, like you know coming into the market. I don't know. Do you see that too? It's like, I see this. No, now. there's very, there's a the lot less, there's a lot less competition here. There's, there's more in the Hudson Valley for sure, because the public data that's available in the Hudson Valley is much, much better and easier acquired than the public data in, in Long Island. In Long Island, it is, it is murderous to get, you can't get, I, you can't get a, 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 delink, a tax delinquent list here. Once a year, you can get it in NASA. You can't get a code violation list here. The townships don't give them. So most people are just are just fighting over the the pre foreclosure list, which is the one list that everybody's not a great list. That's not everybody's a good list. everybody's ripping into. And in New York, it's you know if they speak to an attorney, he's going to tell them you got ten years. Don't worry about it. So um, because there's limited there's limited lists available, 
there's fewer people going into it. And also in general, it's just a, it's an area where there's just, there's just, there's just not a lot of competition, which is strange because you would think that there is would strange. I think another part of it too is probably like the theory is like Long Island's expensive. It's not easy because people in Long Island are different than the Hudson Valley. Westchester is the same, but like up by me where I'm from, it's a little bit different. I yeah. think the theory is, oh, it's so hard in Long Island. And I actually know some people in Long Island who are like starting to market down Hudson Valley, which is fine. And like, they're like, cause they think it's like, oh, it's going to be easier in the Hudson Valley. Eh, I I don't know. I, 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 I never done a Long Island deal, so I can't tell you, but I know that the the thing about expensive markets when you're talking something that's over 500 grand is it's not necessarily the competition i.e westchester it's it's the sophistication of the person you're dealing with like we got to leave westchester um, today and they were right. like ate something for it and i mean we we can't do that and they're not taking a discount it's confirmed it's like right well you think i mean i we, we've spoken about this before but the, the thinking is like in general if you're buying this set you got to buy it at a 70 percent discount minus repairs around there and if you're in a two hundred thousand dollar market, that's paying one hundred and sixty thousand dollars minus repairs. That's Most people there are going to think that's that very doable. That's needs, that's needs they might they might think it needs eighty thousand dollars worth yeah. of repairs. But if you're in a six hundred thousand dollar area and you need a thirty percent discount, that's one hundred eighty thousand dollars. If that guy can really go out and get five hundred for it, and you're going to offer him four hundred for it, it's harder to to accept. People ask me all the time, where should I where should I market? So I say, listen. It's not an easy thing to know, but I said, there's two things that I would recommend. I go, one, yeah. you can work in an area that you know, an area you grew up in or an area you've lived like in, an area you know, that, that, give you, that gives you some um, advantage over people who don't know the area. I said, but in general, go to the lower priced areas, right? The lower priced areas are going to give you more deals than the, the higher priced areas, right? I just had some guy tell me he's got, there's a $1.2 million deal. I could buy it for 900000 I'm like. There's no spread there. It's it, it's a, I said it's gonna cost you over over hundred thousand dollars just to buy it and, and and sell it and then and then it's gonna need work. So in general, you know, and we know guys that do that do humongous deals in very high end areas. But in but in general, it's a hard it's harder to get a because because you said because the the sellers are more sophisticated and because the spreads are 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 so huge, right? Thirty percent on a million dollar deal is three hundred thousand dollars. That's not easy to get somebody to sort of say, well, I know I mean, everything in my area sells for a million, but I'm going to sell to you for 600,000. It's just yeah, not so simple. It, it's, it's, it requires more follow-up. Like I found like, this is a little like rule of thumb for like expensive, like Westchester, probably Nassau, it's the same thing. If I know the as-is value is X and it's financeable and I can get it a hundred grand below that, I can make about $50,000 usually. That's how I look at deals. I look at that a lot, but only up to like, Six seven hundred thousand dollars. That's, that's that, seven hundred and more, below. I need a bigger. I need a bigger. I need a bigger spread, which is a little more. You need like right. one fifty at that because that's the thing I realized is like we've done a lot of deals where we've like done just clean out and list, and when there's like a nice hundred k like real spread between buy price and as is on the market financeable price, the fifty grand will get absorbed, commissions and all that stuff, and then that fifty grand net, I usually I'm like okay I can I can accept that right, and then if we want to wholesale it, obviously below that but right but even if you end up with 40 even if you end up with 30 it's still that's still a good deal right yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I i i use those numbers too in general about a hundred thousand dollar spread and sometimes i tell people i'll straight up tell them i'll say listen i'm gonna give you a number i said but if, if you're gonna sell it to me you're gonna you know, if they could list it i'm gonna say yeah, you yeah, should yeah. really list it because you're gonna leave a hundred thousand dollars on the table and then they want to know why what story and i said because if i buy it i'm gonna be 60 70 thousand dollars in the hole the second i close my closing costs on the buy, my eventual closing costs on the sale, my holding costs while it's going on. I said that's what it's going to cost me just to just to, just to buy it and sell it, and it's true. It is true. It we're buying a house. I'm buying a house on the thirtieth for two ninety five in the Hudson Valley, and our goal is to put it back on the market for like three hundred sixty three seventy, and it's like a little skinny. And I'm like, I'm just going to do it because I told the way I was going to buy it. Can't wholesale it, obviously. Uh, you know, we'll take it. You know, it is what it is at this point. Um, but. I found like I've done deals where like I did one, this was out of state, but I bought it for 230, put 25 into it, sold it for 305 and broke even, you know, they're, they're, all the costs got absorbed. So if you're, if, if you're in these, like, let's say you're in like, what, what, what's that median high price point in your Nassau area? What, like 600 grand, 700 grand kind of. Well, yeah. 600, so, probably 600. Yeah. So, so back to the whole point of what we were saying when the podcast is like, listen, the competition's out of your control. 
But the truth is this, if you, when you start getting leads and you actually make offers and you run into deals, you should be like running towards these problems with the right head. Because if you, if you start just like, just shutting down and complaining, it's, it's, it's going to keep happening. And you're going to start to like, not like the business. Like I remember we had a house, this was an interesting one, but like, there was like all these airship affidavits. This was in New York house had all these liens on it. Like we had to have all of these things happen that were out of our control. And like, I realized when we did the deal, I was like, oh man, this is why we made all this money because the seller gave up on it. We were able to solve it. I had another one, one time, this was crazy. The guy called me. This was nuts. I think I've mentioned this on the show before. Actually, I don't know if I did. 37 well sweep in Sugarloaf, Chester area. The guy calls me. I'll never forget this. I was in college and I took the call and I said, dude, you owe like more money than what this house is worth. And he said, I think the bank will take like nothing for the mortgage payoff. And then we have all these liens. And I was like, okay. So I made the bank a short payoff offer. I didn't, there was no negotiator, it was just me. And they took it. And we had all these liens on the property and I wasn't even experienced at the time. And that whole deal worked out. And it, I made like 30 grand on it, selling it to somebody. And I was like, oh my gosh, like if I didn't make this offer and I just were to just roll my eyes at the problem, I wouldn't have had the deal, right? So never be afraid to make an offer too. That's another, this is another big tip I tell people. Like Todd Toback is a guy I just brought on as like, for like a consult for an hour with Brett. And one of his things he said was like, Make an offer to every seller, no matter what. Doesn't matter. Make the offer in writing. Put it out there, and you. It doesn't matter how ice cold they are. Put the offer. Out. What do you say? What do you send to the sellers? Usually, it's a text or it's an email. Uh, we gotta. I gotta figure something out with the technology where we can have some sort of uh, like maybe Lindsay go in and like push a button to like mail it out. I think there's this thing called Lob that allows you to do that. It's like a software you want, to, that, you want to physically mail it out each time we're not just email it but i'm saying do you send like a, a form is there some kind of form you use no no it says like it, it's like hi this is brett my offer is 375 let us know like it's it's like it's a de deliberate writ piece of writing like it's not like a letterhead or anything like that we just and then like if they follow up with us or we follow up with them we can go back and refer to that it's every another here's another thing too this is a huge piece of advice every offer you make track it in a spreadsheet track that thing. And then you can see how many offers you made for the week. And if you're not getting deals, go look at the document. How many offers? Oh, you made no offers this week. Oh, I wonder why I didn't get any deals. Like, it's, <laughs> like that's like what I train people like get on the phone with me and I say this and they, they, they can't believe it. I'm like, this is the simplest business ever. Track the offer you make. And when you stack up five offers a week in the beginning, give yourself 12 weeks and you should probably have a deal, right? Like what, what are you, what, and that's usually my advice to people, dude. It's like, people are maybe a little disappointed. They want me to tell them something crazy. Like, I don't know. I tell them to say, I should just record the damn thing and just send it to them. I mean, what, what do you, what do you think about that? Track your damn offers, kids. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we discussed this before. We, we both believe strongly that um, offers made, offers made is the number one uh, key performance in the air. That's track. all there is out there. And I find, you know, people come to my office and they say, I, I, somebody called me today. I mean, it's a typical call. I, I'm, a, I'm a wholesaler in New York. I just had a couple of questions. And somebody somebody said, she goes, I've been a wholesaler for two years. I go, okay. How many two offers? Years? Did you make? That's, that's, that's 24 weeks. No, that's, that's 24 months. That's she's, 24 months. Yeah. I said, how many offers did you make? She goes, I made two. I said, listen, if you're making one offer a year, you may get a deal in 25 years. <laughs> I said, Offers is the number one thing. And people and new people are terrified to make a low offer once somebody once a seller injects a price into the conversation. And not, and I would say four to five times they're completely full of crap. I had a deal uh today where the lady said, you know, we uh, I made an offer for like 504 and she said, Well, if I have an, I have other investors coming. If you tell me 525, I'll cancel the appointments. And I and I said, I don't believe her. Like I, I really think what you say. That's, this is interesting. Keep keep going. Um, well, it's with uh, our, my acquisition manager, uh, my part-time acquisition manager, who we know, saying, "Well, wait, maybe should we do it?" And I'm like, I, I, I don't think she's telling the truth. I think she's probably going to take our offer. And I just had another offer where uh, the guy, the guy's attorney, called me and wanted to. I have to call him back. He's like, gave me a higher number, and I'm like. Ah. I don't think that guy is really telling the truth either. Listen, you can, you got to read each situation differently, but, yeah. but, 
for newbie newbie investors are terrified if a seller says, you know, I have a I I I have five I have three other offers at five hundred thousand. You look at it, and you can pay four ten. They're terrified to make that lower offer because they're afraid of how the reaction is going to be. But you can't. That can't be the way you, you are. And you have so what a lot of them do is they just don't make an offer. Oh, and, major mistake. Right. And what happens is some seller has a bullshit story that he's telling everybody, and no one's making him an offer because nobody's professional. And you come in and make an offer, and you can. You know, we have a method to do it where we don't get yelled at. Right. We 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 apologize for it, and we 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 we. And it's the truth because we're making an offer below what the guy said, but. The truth is that we may be the only person making an offer on that, right? If he's telling the same BS story to every investor and no invest, and that's and he's, his numbers are way too high, you may be the only person, and that's crucial to to make an offer every time. Crucial. I've never bought a house I didn't make an offer on. I'll say that one more time slowly. I've never bought a house, comma. I've never made an offer on, right? So, w- even when the seller says that, because I, I that happens to us a lot. I'll give you a little, well, not you, you know what I'm talking about, but I'll, I'll give the listeners a little tip here. So this is how you know if they're full of crap. And so we just had this happen on a, on a Delaware property today. There was like, the guy wants to sell. He doesn't want to do innovation. I don't know why. He's like, I'll just do that myself. I'm like, okay, that's that was one of your options we suggested to you, right? And we're tr- we, like, we think we can sell it to a buyer for like 190. So we want to get it for at least 180, like if not lower. And he was like, not going to budge on the price, like 180 or 190 or bust. And we're like, we couldn't wholesale it to flip it. It's like, eh, maybe put it on the market for 250. It's a skinny deal. Transfer tax in Delaware sucks. So we're like, listen, like we're not going to be at 190. What are your next steps going to be? And usually when they're serious, well, come on, can we do 185? Can we do 180? They'll start kind of like wiggling around with you. But if they're like, no, I'm, if you're not at 180, I'm going to call the realtor up. Well, then, you know, then, you know, they're probably going to do that. Right. But you got to push these people and it, it takes time and skill and, and, and experience, but you got to push them. And it's very uncomfortable in the beginning because it's a kind of a confrontational scenario. If, if you're not used to it, when you push them hard and you say, well, I'm going to go away if I'm not at, at 190, I can't do 190. We're going to go the other way. If there's any wiggle room in that negotiation, they'll start coming back to you. That's what you're finding out. Right. And the, and the new, right. The put the, the pushback that we know is so good and the takeaways that are so good are the things that new investors are terrified to do. Right. Terrified. Terrified. They're thinking, I'm going to lose this deal. I got, I got no deals. This is my one deal. The guy's asking me for 500. Maybe I could pay 450. And they're terrified to say, I'm not going to be at 500. They're just not, they're terrified to say that. They're just, what, what a lot of them do, and this is a huge mistake, and I see this all the time, is they start rationalizing the seller. Well, your neighbor's house sold for 525 but that's a much bigger house. That's a nicer house. And that is the, the, the uh, what's, what do I look mistake. It's the, the mistake of believing that you're going to logically sell the seller on it. Never going to happen. Not, and this is not a logical decision. And most no. 99% of our decisions are not logical. Even the, the ones you and I make, right? We make decisions based on emotion and then we back them up with facts. That's what we do all the time. Everyone. And, uh, and, and new and new, new investors do not understand that. And they still, they, they think I'm going to show this guy all the comps and, uh, Michael, did you see the comps? Right. Oh, you know what? You're right. I'll take hundred thousand dollars less my house. Great. Thank you for convincing that made me. St- I didn't think about that to begin with. You want to hear something? I'll knock your socks off if you're wearing them right now. This is hilarious. This is from today. Nevada lead. We, we've been buying leads in some other areas too. Nevada lead in between Vegas and Phoenix, like middle of nowhere, Nevada. Forget the town. It's listed on the market. Okay. On the market active. Okay, I'm, I already got my money back for the lead. So it's, it's house money at this point. So I'm like, okay, let's swing for the fences here. Like dead set. So it's listed for 425. Okay, not selling. I wonder why. Maybe it might be priced too high, but who knows? I might know <laughs> a thing or two about that. There's a chance. <laughs> so I'm on the phone with Brett and I'm like, okay, this is what we're going to do. Give him a cash offer of 250. They're going to throw it out. They're going to say no way. And I get it. Offer them to novate it. So offer them 305 net. I said, this thing will sell on the market most likely for 350, right? Because it's mispriced right now. And I was looking at comps. I have kind of the MLS out. I have like RPR. It's basically the same thing. And I'm like, okay, I think we could do business here in an ovation at like 350. I said, this, in theory, the logic, if you're a seller, 
is you lower the price, you take better pictures, you make the thing marketable, and you, it sells. This seller is taking a Novation offer for three fifty dollars when it's already on the market, so they have to sign an unconditional release with the realtor. This is all hearsay because we just got it today, like two hours ago. In theory, what they told Brett is they're going to take an, they're going to sign an unconditional release, release with this realtor, which means it'll come off the market. They don't have to pay the commission. I said, Brett, that doc's got to get signed or else we can't do this. Right. Yeah. Uh, then I'm in trouble. Right. And then we're going to go put it back on the market with pictures at a lower price. The seller is going to net their 300 ish grand, which is what they really want. And in theory, and, and the, the reason they took the offer, Brett listened to them better. Brett understands them. Brett took the time to listen to like, like all these, this is the going the extra mile, the whole theme of this podcast. If that whole deal works out, right. And I have my druthers and the whole, the market doesn't collapse, probably make 20, 25 grand. If it all works out on a property that was already listed, there's no logic to do that. Why would you, why would someone do that? Michael? Why? Because no. they it, it's an emotional decision. That's no just logic crazy. whatsoever. Isn't that crazy? Yes. Happen, but it happened again. It's a because, as you said, it's a, it, this is an emotional decision. It is not a uh, it is not a logical decision. It is not. So here are the summaries for everyone as we wrap the show up. Number one, if the problem is hairy, run into the hair, run into the belly of the beast, and that's where the money is made. Right? Don't hesitate to get on the phone and go the extra mile with the seller or the buyer. Number two, make offers make offers on every property. If you're not making offers, you're not even in this business. If someone says they're in this business, like you said, for two years and they've made two offers, I mean, that's an easy job for me. Listen, one offer a year, I can retire at that point. I mean, like one, December 31st, I'd offer you 350. Next year. Bye -bye. <laughs> <laughs> make offers, go the extra mile. You got to understand that offers are the brick that will build this business in New York or in any state you're in. And if you get value from this show, if you feel like your friends need to make more offers, well, send this damn podcast their way. Make them listen to it seven times like I always teach about. And when they listen to it seven times, send me an email, greg at velocityhousefires.com with the subject line. I listen to your podcast seven times. And if you do that, I'll get on the phone with you for a half hour. Mark my words. If you do that, <laughs> I will. Seven times, greg at velocityhousefires.com. I listen to this specific podcast seven times. You got a half hour of my time for free. Look at that offer. I just made an offer. Look at that. Isn't that ironic? Anyway, I hope everyone got value today and uh, we'll talk to you on the next episode. <laughs>